digitalization transformation. Yes, yes, recording, yes. So one of the ways in which digital transformation is very different than previous generations of IT enabled organizational transformation is that it is much more driven by changes that happening in the environment of the firm. So it's much more externally driven than it is internally controlled. And um, part of that trend is consumerization and with that datafication. So there's a widespread, widespread availability of data. And of course, platformization we see through the work of people like Panos. Um, you just think about the special issue that he spearheaded in ISR. You see the rise of platforms and platform business models. And many of them are data platforms. And many of them operate on the basis of data enabled learning and value creation. And that's the topic of today. So this research that I'm gonna to present today is part of my broader agenda of trying to understand digital transformation by understanding one of the key drivers of digital transformation. Yeah? And the concept that we developed in this work is data network effects. So it's a conceptual piece. And let me tell you a story. So some of the world's most profitable firms own platforms, as you know. And as we also know, these platforms exhibit network effects. And a platform or one of its products or services exhibits network effects if the more people that use it, the more valuable it becomes to each user. So essentially the perceived value of a user on a platform is a function of the size of the network or the number of people in the network. And classical examples are, of course, the fax machine, the telephone, etc. Now, we know from past literature that network effects make crucial contributions to the perceived user value. So there is a clear linkage uh, between those two concepts. And we know that from vast amount of research that has been published across economics, business, and IT, IS, and one of the works here is the work by Parker. Now, what the research has focused on so far is two categories of network effects. We see the indirect network effects and the direct network effects. And sometimes they're also called same side and cross side network effects. Now, the observation that we made was that little attention has been paid to data network effects. And we think that this is an emerging category of network effects. And you see, for example, the Economist has published a whole special issue on this topic. And they kind of um, stated that the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data. And by the way, in this special issue on The Economist, they even mentioned the term data network effects. And it was very surprising to, to me and my co-authors, my co-authors here, by the way, being Ola Henfredsson, Evgeny Kagener, and Harris Kuryako, we were very surprised to see that data network effects were clearly on the rise, clearly being discussed in the general public to make sense of these data platforms like Google, Facebook, et cetera. And it's, it was also clear that these platforms are data platforms, data aggregators that essentially create value and capture value by collecting data on each user, learning from the data, constantly improving their products and services and thereby creating some kind of a virtuous cycle. But it was very surprising to us that none of this, none of this was theorized in the literature. This was a huge surprise. Um, so what is data network effects? So a platform exhibits data network effects if the more that the platform learns from the data it collects on users, the more valuable the platform becomes to each user. So in other words, the perceived value for each user is not only a function of the size of the network and the number of users in the network, but increasingly also a function of to what extent the platform is able to scale the learning from the data collected on each user and bring back the benefits to each user as a result of that learning. This is a fundamental uh, this is a fundamentally different logic, right? So it's, uh, there is an interaction between traditional network effects and data network effects, but we argue that 
data network effects is a separate category because the logic and the way that value is created and generated uh, is, is different than traditional network effects. It's not just the number of users, okay? And as we are here in the group interested in digital, we can all kind of imagine that um, the reason why we have data network effects today is of course because of rising digital density. Uh, we see the widespread adoption and diffusions of digital infrastructure, including the internet and other digital infrastructures that build on the internet. And of course, digital platforms, products and services that build on that. So we have a whole stack of digital that has penetrated all aspects of our lives. And without that digitalization, we wouldn't see this phenomenon of data network effects, right? And so we see this as a phenomenon that is inherently interesting for us as IS researchers or researchers that are trying to span the boundaries between IS and management it is inherently interesting for us to theorize about this. Um, so here is like one of the many examples that you find when you just um, look up on the internet examples of data network effects. Um, the more clients and new sellers subscribers, the more data is submitted to us, the better the machine learning algorithms, the better the product, and that attracts more clients. So CB Insights has kind of applied the data network effects concept to their own business model and have tried to express it in these terms. And you find many of these examples out there. So data network effects is in fact part of the vocabulary of platform companies and digital players out there which highlights the relevance of the phenomenon. Yeah, we wanna address a relevant phenomenon in developing novel theory. Um, potentially, which underscores the importance of the topic, data network effects could be a source of competitive advantage. We don't have a systematic explanation for that yet. Maybe, maybe one of you is gonna develop that theory, but there is potentially a linkage here. Um, Anecdotal evidence would suggest so. You know, if you look at uh, Tesla, for example, Tesla competes clearly on data network effects and the software based autopilot capability that they are developing. You know, the cars uh, are constantly collecting data. Um, that data is being analyzed. The autopilot is constantly being updated and improved. And that happens in the background, even if you're not using the autopilot function, right? So it's, it's something that happens uh, every minute. Um, we see the role of artificial intelligence in giving rise to data network effects. Um, and there is a, a number of reasons why this is the case. So with artificial intelligence, we all know that it all originates from that time period around um, towards the end of the Second World War when the, um, the British and uh, the others were trying to kind of fight the Germans in the Second World War and they came up with this idea of this general purpose computer. Um, and obviously there was in 1956, the Dartmouth summer and the artificial intelligence researchers came together. This whole field started, it started as a field of research. The idea was to create a machine that is able, able to, to reason and to think and to abstract and to perceive the same way that human beings do, a very broad ambition. But for many decades, there was like this symbolic system. There was this idea of codifying the human brain into symbolic logic. And so most of AI, AI kind of systems were based on symbolic logic. And it resulted to this AI winter because of a combinatorial explosion. So there were just too many combinations. Not everything could be programmed explicitly. And it was just impossible to account for all different variations of context and conditions and um, and create that artificial, artificially intelligent software for everything. That was just impossible. And so it led to this uh, di disillusion, disillusion with the ambition and an AI winter. And then we came out of the AI winter and we transitioned from symbolic systems to statistical learning. And statistical learning is essentially what is behind machine learning, right? So it's basically statistical learning. And the rise of that is because of exponential rise of computing power the greater availability of data because of digital density, improvement of the algorithms themselves, and more open source tools. So we see that AI is playing a very important role here. Uh, it enables platforms, products, and services to generate user value. So in order to understand data network effects, we need to understand AI here as well. And an example here is um, Waze. 
Um, the navigation services, they leverage data collected about users to offer dynamic turn-by-turn -turn navigation and to continuously improve the predictions uh, to traffic situations. Yeah. So let's have a look at um, the broader diffusion of AI and what is the impact on, of that phenomenon for our theory of network effects. So let's kind of bring these two things together. Um, and we see here a traditional perspective of network effects, the way that a network effects scholar would teach it in the classroom, would draw it in a way, right? Uh, very simplified view, same side network effects, cross side network effects. The platform would typically uh, be black boxed. It would be completely black boxed, right? And, and this is surprising because, um, um, you know, it's probably because most of research on network effects has been done by um, people outside of the IS field who are not inherently interested in the uh, technology, in the role of um, the platform itself, the architecture of the platform, you know, the way that it is designed, um, um, et cetera. And so the way that the users interact with the platform, that is something that traditional scholars of network effects were maybe not interested in, but we as information systems scholars are interested in that, right? We're interested how humans and machines interact. We are interested in the interactions between users and technology. This is something that we are interested in, in the IS discipline. So as IS researchers, we have an advantage there to have a perspective on this network effects phenomenon that others may not be able to have. So there was a unique opportunity to theorize about data network effects being an information systems offer group. And I think the editor kind of realized that. Our editor was Alan Afua, and in fact, Alan Afua has done research on network effects himself. And so when he um, received the submission to the AMR hackathon um, in, at ES in Barcelona, so we were lucky that AMR came to Barcelona uh, to organize their yearly hackathon, and we applied with a paper, and we got assigned Alan Afua as an editor. And his work on network effects was very influential for us. We, um, we kind of read that very carefully. And one of the papers that he wrote in 2013 is this paper on, is network effects really about size? Um, and he elaborated on the role of structure and conduct. So other network characteristics other than size. So Alan Afua made a very important contribution by opening the eyes of people that perceived value for each user on the platform is not necessarily only a function of network size, but also a function of other network characteristics. This is important because it diverges from the standard definition of network effects, right? Where the, st the standard definition of network effects, the concept itself is typically just focused on the number of users and the size of the network. So Alan Afua really opened uh, our eyes. Interestingly, the paper went rather unnoticed in the literature, right? I think we are kind of the first to really build upon this, uh, this idea like systematically and take it to the next level. Um, so it's, um, it shows that when there is a concept that has been established over multiple decades of research, not only are there powerful scholars acting as gatekeepers, but also there's inertia, there's cognitive inertia to accept something that is that diverges from that, you know? Um, so it takes sometimes uh, perhaps a very different kind of an offer group coming from a very different kind of a field to come in and to, and to say, look, here's something interesting that you may not be seeing, you know? And the reason why we were seeing it is because we had this understanding of digital. And we had this understanding that with the rise of digital infrastructures and digital connectivity, we see the rise of data, the greater availability of data, and we see new dynamics of data-enabled value creation and capture on platforms that essentially change the way that the network is structured and changes the network conduct. And you can see that, everybody can see that when you just look at examples like Waze, when you look at Uber uh, as an example, when you look at Facebook as an example, you can take any, any digital platform and analyze how the digital 
you know, the, the, the digital architecture of this platform is essentially shaping and redefining the interactions of the users and changing the structure uh, and the conduct in the network. So it is, it is pretty obvious to us as, as, as scholars interested in digital, not so obvious to people in the management discipline who have never thought about these things. Um, Uber, for example, uses machine learning to influence network structure and conduct. And one of the uh, recent papers um, that was spearheaded here by Mareike is, um, is explaining that in, in a great level of detail, um, how that actually works. And we use that example of Uber in the AMR paper as well. We have, we have made extensive use of Uber as an example in the AMR paper. Um, because obviously, um, even before this MISQ paper was published, um, Rosenblatt and others have already documented in a descriptive manner uh, many of the dynamics that happen in the Uber uh, platform and environment. So we were able to draw on the Uber example in our AMR paper a lot. So this is, this is important. So there is a role of artificial intelligence, specifically machine learning, so narrow AI in the form of applied machine learning. And there is, um, from a theoretical standpoint, Perceived value is not just a function of the size, but also a function of the structure and the conduct. This is essential for us to build the, the core logic of our theoretical model. These are the core ideas. That's the starting point. Now, whenever you do kind of fresh theorizing in an area where you feel like there are established assumptions that no longer work, as you know, um, work by Thomas would also show, challenging uh, underlying assumptions can be useful and establishing an assumption ground for as a basis for fresh theorizing can be very useful. And we did that in the AMR paper. So um, we got also inspiration from the 2013 AFUA paper because that's exactly what AFUA also did. So in a way we, we got some inspiration there. So the first assumption that we make is that the computer um, in the middle of every transaction turns these platforms into flexible infrastructures that are capable of learning. So the infrastructure that facilitates the interactions between users on a platform is no longer just static. So if you just read Parker's work, you know, um, you get the sense that there is this view of static infrastructures, that the platform defines the interactions between users on the platform by providing the infrastructure. And it seems almost like these interactions are like programmed, you know? And we have a different view. So with the role of AI, we see that uh, these infrastructures are more flexible and they're capable of learning. But second, um, we know that um, machine learning and data plays a strategic role, and particularly data is a valuable asset. So that's something that comes from work by Eric Brynjolfsson and other um, people at the intersection between IS and economics and business. Third, we know that consumerization, particularly IT consumerization, has blurred the line between consumption and production, and this has turned users into prosumers who co-create value. So the users don't just act as consumers or as users in the traditional sense, right? Um, and this is important because as we know in these data platforms, the users are the ones who generate, who share and who provide the, that critical resource, that, that those data resources, it all comes from the user. So you are in a way, you know, you are co-creating uh, on the platform as a user, you are a prosumer. Um, and of course, that is inspired by uh, our previous work on IT consumerization and MISQ. And then the fourth assumption is um, that for long-term success, platform owners must balance diverse stakeholder interests. And this is something that you know, can be directly derived from the debates that happened around the year 2018, 2019. There was a tipping point. When you follow the public conversation, there was a very important tipping point when the society, um, for example, the regulators, the politicians, the, the people themselves, the users themselves who started to have more backlash and show more opposition against some of the data practices of platforms, 
so there was a tipping point where The Economist even wrote an, an entire series of articles about it, and HBR started to publish some articles about it as well, where people realized these platforms, you know, it's not all good, right? And if we don't balance diverse stakeholder interests, then long-term, these platforms are not going to survive. And in fact, today, this is generating a whole movement of Web3 and decentralized platforms. The reason why we have this enthusiasm for blockchain, Web3, and decentralized platforms, the whole reason is because of the limitations that we saw in the Web2 platform economy era. And um, we realized that for long-term success, platform laws must balance diverse stakeholder interests. So these assumptions are all in a way trying to capture the new status quo um, that is the foundation for um, you know, creating, creating the right um, foundations here for developing a novel theory. And then we have this novel, novel model. We don't call it a theory. So it's a model, it's a theoretical framework. It's a theoretical framework or model. Um, and the core idea here is that artificial intelligence capability of a platform determines the perceived user value. And then you have a couple of moderators that influence this main relationship. So the first component is the platform AI capability. Mm. And I'm doing a little bit of storytelling here, right? And um, so making it easy for the reader to follow along the line of argumentation when reading the article. So um, the engine, the engine driving data network effects is platform AI capability, defined as the ability of a platform to learn from data to continuously improve its products and services for each user. You know, that's where you have this connection to network effects, right? Um, so the main mechanism for which the platform AI capability may enhance the perceived user value is by improving prediction. And this is something that we fought hard about when we were developing the theory, we fought very hard about how can we communicate something complex AI to the management audience in a simple way, you know, because Alan Afua kind of sensitized us to that issue that most people in management, the readership of AMR would probably, most, most readers would probably not be very familiar with these things. And so we need to make it, uh, we need to find the right level of abstraction and make it um, understandable. And we try to boil it down, we try to abstract, we try to abstract and boil it down. What is the key about this artificial intelligence? And we boil it down to prediction based on this book that we had read about prediction machines. So that provided us the inspiration. Um, and then we found some more serious uh, literature to support that idea. And uh, one article goes all the way back to 1961. A prediction describes the ability of a system to draw upon existing data about the past and present to generate information about the future. So as you, as you will notice along the way in this presentation and in developing the AMR article, we spent a lot of time uh, tweaking um, each definition of each concept to have maximum concept clarity. But that's something that we can also talk about more in the PhD seminar later. So, the information that is uh, generated from the prediction can help forecast future events or provide recommendations for action. So let, let's look at two examples here, a credit, credit worthiness decision made by a lending platform to improve the light, uh, to, to, to predict the likelihood that someone will pay back a loan, right? The detection of fraud and credit card transactions, etc. many examples. Let's take a look inside. You know that I'm a fan of Herbert Simon. Um, you know that ever since I published that paper on heuristic theorizing, where I draw heavily on um, Herbert Simon's work. And Herbert Simon has done work on artificial intelligence as well. So uh, I just find this fascinating, uh, this, um, the legacy um, of, of Herbert Simon and the, the work that he did across so many disciplines. Now, he wrote this one article in 1995 on artificial intelligence. And that really caught my attention. Uh, the key idea that I had identified in reading the article was this idea of learning from examples. 
And he says literally in the paper, a number of systems have been constructed that learn from their own problem solving efforts or from the successful pro problem solving efforts of others in the form of worked out examples of problem solutions. So for example, to develop a reliable fraud detection model, as in the example given above, an, a balanced training data set with past fraudulent and non-fraudulent ex, uh, examples of credit card transactions must be created and fed into a machine learning algorithm during training. So this is just a, a very simple, um, simple introduction and explanation of how this works so that readers can actually follow along our line of argumentation. We're not going into a lot of details here. We're not distinguishing between you know, supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement learning, deep learning. We're not doing these kind of distinctions in the paper. We're keeping it at a pretty abstract level. We're just talking about uh, machine learning at a more abstract level here. And um, um, you know, you could criticize us for not being accurate here. You know, what type of machine learning is this? And you know, but it's not it's not relevant for the main theoretical line of argumentation in the in the article. Um, so let's talk about biases. And this is something that this was like a, a that that was one of those other catches. Like this article on artificial intelligence was like when when I found that it was like wow, that's it. You know, when I found this article. That was another big breakthrough moment in developing the paper, you know? So uh, I was uh, really happy when I found this one. So intuitive prediction biases and corrective procedures by Kahneman and Tversky. And of course, previously I had um, not completely read, but I had bought a copy of that big book that, uh, you know, the, you know, that book, um, um, Thinking Slow, Thinking Fast or something like that, you know, like, I had started reading that and I was fascinated by this work by Kahneman and Tversky. And now I had this article and that was very helpful in the paper. So under certain circumstances, which include training the machine learning algorithms with adequate data sets, machine generated predictions can help avoid human cognitive biases and making assessments and forming judgments. Wow, that's a big statement, right? So many of you would disagree. So. Um, there's a reason why we said under certain circumstances, right? Um, and, and, and you will immediately know why, because you all know about this. Um, I'm talking to an expert audience here. But um, so we, we kind of, we kind of um, theorize about the role of computation in um, the relationship between computation and biases here. So for instance, in discussing how to deal with the known overconfidence bias in which a person's subjective confidence in their judgments is greater than the objective accuracy of those judgments, Kahneman and Tversky stated the following, the most radical suggestion is to replace such assessments by computation. You cannot imagine how many times I underlined that sentence when I was reading that paper. I still remember having that printed out paper on intuitive prediction in my office in, in IESA with that nice view towards TB Dabo, uh, Katarina will know, and I had this paper and, you know, how many times had I underlined that sentence? And I was so enthusiastic about it. I went over to the offices of Evgeny and, and Harris and said, look, look what I found, look what I found. We need to discuss it immediately. Those are those kind of moments where you realize you're making progress on a paper. So two things, the speed of prediction and the accuracy of prediction. So a platform AI capability offering a greater speed of prediction helps to offset some of the value destroying dynamics and help to foster value enhancing interactions among users by minimizing the time between when a salient change in the network structure or conduct occurs and when the platform detects that change and generates appropriate uh, recommendations to influence the network. So again, this is a mouthful. So just remember, the basis for our theorization is the idea of Alan Afua 2013 not only network size, but also network conduct and network structure influences the perceived value for each user. Once you get that, you can say that AI and machine learning plays a role in influencing the network, right? And in fact, I remember still talking to executives at Uber as part of this uh, algorithmic management study. I did a couple of interviews to help out Mareike as we were doing that data collection. And in one of the interviews that I did, I remember that the uh, uh, was a um, senior manager from the Netherlands at Uber. He said, he literally said, you know, we try to influence the network, you know? 
So some of that language was in the back of my head that in a way these platforms leverage AI to influence the network in their favor, to influence the supply and the demand and the way that, uh, so the way that the behaviors, right? To influence the behaviors of the participants. So you are influencing the network conduct, right? And you are influencing the structure of the network by balancing supply and demand. So that that's all in that sentence, right? And um, now the greater the speed of prediction, the higher the perceived user value is likely to be. And an example is Uber. So to prevent fraudulent behaviors such as pre-arranged trips between riders and drivers that limit open competition by letting its algorithms monitor this, any kind of signs or cues about potentially fake trips, like you requesting, requesting, accepting and completing trips on the same device yeah, with the same payment profile or excessive promotional trips, excessive cancellations. So if you're canceling all the time, right? That gives the, uh, the algorithm cues that there may be fraudulent behavior and what, what Uber calls fraudulent behavior, right? Um, and then the algorithm can kind of nudge the behavior and can try to um, kind of influence the conduct of the network to the benefits of the users. Now, the faster that happens, the faster that happens and the less time elapses between fraud and behavior and the changes in behavior, the better it is, right? So the speed matters. Second, the accuracy of prediction matters. So a platform AI capability ensuring greater accuracy of prediction helps reduce deviations from what has been forecasted or recommended to what ev events or outcomes have actually occurred. So you're looking at the actual occurrence of events versus what was forecasted and predicted, and you want to reduce deviations, right? Um, increasing the transaction feasibility and bolstering the perception of trust among network users. So why do we use these, why do we use that language? Why do we use that term? Why do we say bolstering the perception of trust? Why do we say increasing transaction feasibility? Because this is the connection to Alan Afua 2013. So when you read Alan Afua 2013 line by line, you see that there are concepts in that paper related to trust, related to the feasibility of the transaction. So we're making an explicit connection conceptually to Afua 2013 to really build a theoretically sound argument here for our proposition. So the greater the accuracy of prediction, the higher the perceived user value is likely to be. For example, when the Uber platform indicates an estimated arrival time of three minutes, but it takes the car 10 minutes to pick up the customer, the value of the platform in this particular case decreases. And I recently had that kind of an experience myself. I was standing with Ola in front of his house and we wanted to go to the North American Bitcoin conference that was like last week. And uh, Ola had uh, uh, asked for an Uber taxi and it said, it's gonna arrive in seven minutes. And then uh, Ola was complaining all the time because he said, look, look, it still says seven minutes. You know? and, and he said that they over, they, they, there's always like more minutes. And in reality, in reality, it takes always more than what Uber kind of says, right? That, that's not good, right? So that's, that's, not, that's not accuracy, right? Uh, and, and, and Uber seems to, to do that uh, on purpose, um, you know, but um, we were theorizing back in the days that the greater the accuracy, the better it is for each user. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's the, be the better thing for the, for the Uber platform. So the platform owner may, may do things that are not optimal for the user, okay? So bear in mind, this is very important, bear in mind, what are we trying to explain here? We are trying to explain perceived user value. We are not explaining the ability of the, well, the, the, the desire of the platform owner to capture all the value. This is future research. We need more research that examines value capture by the platform owner, because that's something that we didn't focus in this paper. We just focus on perceived user value, okay? The second, um, okay, so now we're gonna look at uh, the first moderator. Hmm. So now that we understand the basic relationship between platform AI capability and perceived user value, we're looking at value creation, not value capture by the platform owner, right? 
we need to think about what influences this relationship so that that relationship will be stronger or weaker. Data are oftentimes referred to as the oil fueling the information economy. We know that. So we know that data is a valuable asset, assumption number two within our framework. And with each component of our model, we are making a connection to a specific assumption, right? So let's have a look. So when supplied with sufficient quality and quantity of oil, the engine may provide more value to its users. And similarly, we think that the effect of platform AI capability on perceived user value is moderated by data quantity and data quality. So we look at this as the oil that fuels the engine. Without data in sufficient quality and quantity, the engine, i.e. the platform AI capability, cannot be leveraged, cannot be developed and be leveraged to its full uh, potential and extent. Okay. And of course, you know, this may seem boring uh, to, to some of you because you say, oh, yeah, he's, he's just he's just explaining to me how machine learning works, you know. Uh, I already know of all of that, you know. But imagine like expressing these things in theoretical terms that everyone in management can understand it. That's the whole trick. Like I don't I don't think that what we did with this paper was novel in the sense of um, you know from from an information systems research perspective. Like we're not saying anything that is mind blowing here, you know, like we're not saying anything new in that sense. But we're just kind of putting it together in a way that we theorize it so that everybody can understand it, even outside of the IS discipline. That's kind of what we're doing here. Now, of course, you need to ensure data quality and data quantity, right? So uh, that's where we came up with the concept of data stewardship. And that's very much inspired by work of uh, people like Barb Wixon, with whom I work at uh, MIT CISR, and um, Jeannie Ross and uh, Peter Weil, these kind of people there. And that's that's so this idea of enterprise-wide holistic management of a firm's data assets to help ensure the adequate data quantity and data quality. A lot of work has been published in IS about, um, about these things, including also my former colleagues at UVA, Brent Kitchens, um, Ahmed Abbasi, who is now at Notre Dame, uh, Dobolgi, who is now also at Notre Dame, and then these other folks here from MIT. So a lot of research coming out of the IS field about this topic. And, um, data stewardship acts as a mechanism of data network effects. Note, note, we're trying to theorize the mechanisms that generate and activate and leverage data network effects on the platform, right? So data stewardship acts as a mechanism by helping fuel the engine, making the platform more valuable to each user for increased speed and accuracy of prediction. Now, quantity. Going back again to intuitive prediction. A common reason for inaccurate predictions by a person is the tendency to rely too much on singular information. So you have singular information um, and you underweight or ignore distributional information. And this is called an internal approach to prediction. And it's a common bias in prediction, okay? Um, and um, you need to compare the particular case at hand with the distribution of cases in the same class to help avoid biases in the interpretation of data. This is what is called an external approach to prediction. So an external approach to prediction is facilitated by greater data quantity. The larger the volume of data about past cases, the greater the ability to build and train learning algorithms on a strong distributional data set and facilitate an external approach to prediction, increasing the accuracy and speed of prediction. Proposition 2A, the greater the quantity of data for training the machine learning algorithms on the platform, the stronger will be the relationship between platform AI capability and perceived user value. So the way that this proposition is worded is clearly as a moderator, right? We're looking at this uh, relationship and whether it will be strengthened or weakened, right? Um, an example is DeepMind's AlphaGo system that was trained on a vast number of examples taken from many Go games with expert players. Um, uh, and um, so large number of cases. Now, when I was developing that idea, I had in mind this example that we use in teaching, IBM Watson, you know, and how IBM Watson is used uh, or, you know, is um, trying to be used in healthcare to predict cancer. So that was kind of the inspiration for me 
coming up with this kind of idea, you know, like sometimes you look at these practical examples and it does something to you in your brain and it helps you to make some connections of what you need to look for in terms of theorization. So Kahnemann and Tversky, they explain that human predictors typically suffer from an overconfidence bias as well. So this, this article was just like a gold mine. Uh, it was like uh, finding that article. Um, it, it provided such a good foundation. So they talk about the overconfidence bias, whereby the certitude, the certitude concerning a given estimate tends to be higher than justified by the available evidence. I know this is interesting because again, I was thinking about the IBM Watson healthcare example that I use in my teaching. And you know, the IBM Watson not only gives you the prediction, but it also shows you the confidence level, whether treatment A or treatment B or treatment C will be effective in dealing with a certain cancer type. So this idea of, of providing you with that confidence level, that for me, there was an immediate connection to this theory from 1977 around the overconfidence bias, yeah? So in principle, these biases can be overcome by computation and machine learning. By avoiding the overconfidence bias requires the use of a data set that is complete, reliable, and appropriate for the task at hand. So in other words, the data must be of sufficient quality. And this is something that, you know, you read Kahneman and Tversky and the hints to, for that logic are already there in that article from 1977. I mean, isn't that amazing? I'm not saying anything new here, am I? So data quality includes aspects of truthfulness, completeness, consistency, and timeliness. And that's coming from a bunch of uh, papers, uh, one of them in management science. Uh, I think the Balu paper is from management science. One paper from, uh, is this, can, no, Kalinikos, Constant, is, there, is this, no, is this, this, no, this is not Constantine. This is not you, Panos. This is somebody else. Constantine. This is Ioana from CBS. Ioana, Uyana. Yeah. Yeah. So you see, there is a lot of research on that uh, that has been done already as well. Uh, so the better the quality of data, the greater the likelihood of reducing or eliminating the prevalent overconfidence bias in prediction. And that will also strengthen then the relationship, the main relationship that we're trying to explain between platform AI capability and perceived user value. So that leads us to proposition 2B, the higher the quality of data for training machine learning algorithms on the platform, the stronger will be the relationship between platform AI capability and user value. And you will see that this structure of how we word the propositions repeats itself so that we have a consistency and it's easy for the reader to understand. For example, popular fare aggregators and travel medium search engines such as kayak.com offer several alternative routes alongside their prices so that you can choose from to reach their desired destination. So more truthful, more complete, more consistent, and more timely the data set the aggregator platform draws on, um, the faster and the better are the predictions and thus also the recommendations offered to each user. I took a picture of BMW because Ola, Ola loves his BMW and he thinks it's such a great design. So I took a picture of BMW, even though I drive a Subaru. But user-centric design, the perceived value of a fueled engine is likely to be only as strong as the design of the car in which the engine is installed because the design shapes the experience of the driver. You know, you sit next to Ola and then he, he goes like, vroom, vroom, and he shows how fast his car is. And, so clearly um, the value depends on the design as well. Um, so to create value for users, firms designing products and services in the era of AI must adapt to consumerization, right? And, and we, know, we know from prior research um, that consumerization has changed the relationship between um, users and platforms and it has turned them into prosumers it has blurred the lines between consumption, consumption and production, and it, um, it, and, and it, it forces firms to, to adapt to consumerization by adopting a user-centric design approach. And we define that as becoming closer to users and better understanding their needs to help increase the performance and the effort expectancy of the products and the services. 
we draw on uh, a key reference here that uh, Ola brought into the mix here. That uh, was a very great suggestion made by him uh, based on his previous research in that area. Uh, user-centric design involves applying design to get closer to users and better understand their needs. Very simple definition. I loved it. Without Ola, I wouldn't have known. By better understanding real user needs and designing the platform's products and services in a way that closely meets their expectations, their habits, their whims, their desires, this is language coming from the sociologist Gabriel, user-centric design empowers and engages users to co-create value by contributing with their feedback and personal data to the ongoing improvement and tuning of the AI models and features of the platform, right? And we all know what an integral role the users play in the continuous learning and um, improvement of the machine learning algorithms on the diverse platforms, right? Spotify, Facebook, etc. So proposition 3A and 3B, the higher the performance expectancy, the stronger will be the relationship between platform AI capability and perceived user value, and the same with effort expectancy. And here, from an IS standpoint, this is pretty boring because we're just leveraging existing theory uh, of um, IT adoption, um, which, which is pretty much established by, by this point in time, right? But we're bringing this kind of into um, this picture because it is an essential component that we cannot miss. Yeah. This one, I I'm, I'm feel, uh, uh, wait a minute, that was too fast. What, what did I, what did I, how do I go back? Wait a minute, go back, no. This is how I go back, yeah. So this one I feel pretty excited about. And this is basically Evgeny. So Evgeny Kagana, our co-author on the paper, he um, has this background of having done research with institutional theory. And we kind of thought about this institutional perspective on, on this, uh, in this model and, and um, the way that we think about it is that a car may be nicely designed, think about the BMW, and powered by a good engine supplied with sufficient quantities of high quality oil, but people may still not want to use the car if they also, uh, if they also consider it safe and secure and the perceived risk of an accident is low. So they will only use it if it is perceived to be safe and secure, right? And they will only use it if they think that the risk of an accident is low. And here's an example of a Tesla, uh, sad story. So we need, to, we need to make sure that there is le legitimation, that the platforms have legitimacy. And we know that they have recently lost a lot of legitimacy. There are even talks about breaking up uh, some of these platform companies in the US. Um, drawing on this analogy, platform owners must balance diverse stakeholder interests to mitigate the perceived risks related to data privacy and security as well as the interpretability and explainability of AI. So there are two key components, security slash privacy, interpretability, explainability of AI. These are the two key things that we theorize about here. And so we theorize about this third key mechanism of data network effects, which is actions, including the responsible use of data and ensuring the explainability of AI must be considered to be strategic, right? because they play an important role in strengthening the relationship between platform AI capability and perceived user value by avoiding accidents such as data security breaches, data privacy violations, and other unintended consequences of unexplainable machine behavior. We need to draw on some theory. So in any uh, AMR paper, we're always bringing in some theory. And before we had um, you know, Herbert Simon and we had Tversky and Kahneman, and now we're bringing in and we had um, the, the, the sociologist and the design, design theorists, and now we're bringing in uh, Sushman, and we're bringing in a definition of legitimacy. A generalized perception or assumption that the actions of an entity are desirable, proper, or appropriate within some socially constructed system of norms, beliefs, and definitions. We arguably, many of these data platform companies, um, um, the actions of these platform companies are not considered to be desirable, proper, and appropriate. They have lost the trust of many people, right? Um, the crucial resources in the case of platforms is personal data and the financial means and the technological capabilities needed to set up these learning algorithms to train the models and develop new platform features. So let's have a look at personal data. So a key aspect is to utilize the personal data in a responsible way, right? Uh, in a way that the stakeholder audiences will judge this to be the right thing to do. 
And meeting these morally desirable principles such as privacy by design and security by design leads us to this fourth, uh, to this proposition 4A. The higher the moral desirability of the use of personal data, the stronger will be the relationship between platform AI capability and perceived user value. In other words, do the right thing and use personal data in a way that is perceived to be the right thing to do by the constituent stakeholder audience. Example, Facebook has repeatedly attracted legitimation scrutiny from key stakeholder audiences because of its repeated failures to ensure the privacy and security of its data. Think about the Cambridge Analytica scandal. I also wrote a whole teaching case about that, the 2018 case at ESA, um, the data scandal case of Facebook. So I've been thinking about that for quite some years now and also teaching a course on digital ethics um, once a year in Germany, where I kind of discuss these things in, in great amount of detail. So it's something that I really wanted to bring into this paper. Um, now, the prediction explainability is the other factor that um, everybody's talking about with AI, the black box issue, right? Um, so you need to ensure the explainability or the interpretability of the functioning and the coherence and understanding of these AI models, because only, only if you achieve that can a stakeholder assess the meaningfulness of the predictions and renew the trust and the commitment to grant critical resources. This is key because in institutional theory, the way that you, you want to please stakeholders because you want to get access to key resources from the environment. And that is critical for your survival. Proposition 4B, the higher the explainability of predictions, the stronger will be the relationship between platform AI capability and user value. We get to the model and we can discuss the implications. Integrating the model with the existing network effects literature, the main overarching thing here is that we need to examine interactions between data network effects and network effects. Only looking at traditional network effects is too limiting and cannot explain the full ways and mechanisms by which user value is created. The specific implications are that in many contexts, data network effects may even be more dominant than traditional network effects because the user experience is heavily shaped by the scale of learning from data collected on users. And this is especially in, in information intensive contexts like banking and uh, entertainment and media and um, you know, social platforms. So in many of these contexts, you, you see a very dominant role of data. And then maybe in other contexts, um, it, it, it really depends on the degree to which data is important, yeah? But then second, you need to look at the interactions between the data network effects and the direct network effects. So Facebook, for example, has achieved a gr great growth, but at some point without data network effects on top of the direct network effects, they couldn't kind of sustain the growth. So there was a critical point when um, they, they needed to kind of transition more to data network effects in order to keep that growth going. And then with indirect network effects, think of this example of Apple rolling out these uh, this AI model framework for iOS developers, so that in a way the the matching of the supply to the demand and the uh, the way that the developers are attracted to the platform, right, is because of the data from the users that is generating this these um, that is um, being leveraged through this AI model framework for iOS developers, and so you see data network effects operating on top of uh, indirect network effects. So we need to study those interactions as well. So what is future work, um, what would be useful? Empirically examine data network effects in the context of direct or indirect network effects to examine the interactions. Distinguish between positive and negative data network effects. Uh, explore the impact of AI and data network effects on the value uh, to the platform owner as well. Taking the platform owner perspective and thinking about value capture. Um, could we understand the linkage to competitive advantage by doing so? We have not been able to do that in this paper. Explore the interaction between artificial and collective intelligence because machines learn, humans learn, right? Human machine interactions, we, we could unpack that much more. And then there are a few things that happened. There was a debate, Klau and Wu uh, published a, an article that uh, was uh, questioning whether data network effects actually exist. And we clarified in our response in the recently published article that there are two conditions for data network effects. The first is 
that the learning from one user should translate into a better product or experience for other users, not just a single user. So in other words, as more users use the product, the product must improve the experience for all users. That's one of the conditions for a network effect, okay? The second condition is that the product experience enhancement from learning should happen fast enough to affect the current value of the product. It should benefit its current users, not the next product generation's users. In other words, the product improves over the consumption lifetime with more users adopting it. Otherwise, there is also not a condition for data network effects to occur. And so what's the role of AI? There are two key characteristics of AI that make that possible and that help to fulfill these conditions, right? Um, so a core characteristic of AI is learning from individual cases to identify and translate patterns into predictable models that feed into the iterative improvement of the experience for other users as well, not just a single user, Google. Google is the best example, right? Uh, Google is essentially all driven by, uh, to a large extent, by data network effects, yeah? Second, another core characteristic of AI is the ability to efficiently scale data-enabled learning to instantly and instantly release the resulting improvements in real time to enhance the product experience and the perceived value of, of each other user as well. So it happens kind of dynamically in real time during the consumption lifetime. So again, AI contributes to fulfilling that second assumption or co a condition. The other thing that Cloud will talk about is that they think that the, the data exists internal to the boundaries of the firm. And we say, no, um, data are seldom just strategic resources that exist internal to the boundaries of the firm, right? In a great deal of context, they are also a medium of signification and a carrier of facts and meanings that serve as a basis for learning and discovery. And you start actually sharing data because the more that you share data, the more that you can generate value through learning and improvement from that data. Uh, it's actually the reverse. If you just keep it locked up in silos, you're actually not doing anything from the data, right? And so that's something that I, I definitely learned through all my research with uh, MIT, uh, for example, a Microsoft case that we have been analyzing. Um, Second, data do not have to be owned to learn and improve for the use of AI. So there are data exchanges, for example, where you can get access to data, you can train your machine learning algorithms, develop a platform AI capability, and you haven't even kind of, um, you know, brought that data, um, you know, you haven't acquired that data and, um, you know, acquired control of, exclusive control of that data. So you're not looking at data necessarily as something that exists only within the boundaries of the firm. So Clow and Wu, are kind of taking a traditional perspective um, on how firms achieve a competitive advantage with proprietary resources, almost like the traditional resource-based view of the firm. Um, and third, a significant overarching development that will shift the focus further is um, the token economy. So we're shifting from a platform economy to a token economy. And again, that will change and create a shift from data monopolies to data sovereignty. And once we have that, Again, we'll see the shift from firm resource to shared data. And again, um, that is a, a counter perspective to Clow and Wu. And value creation and capture do not need to be exclusive. So currently in the platform economy, we think that platform owners, they capture most of the value and the users, you, value may be created for users, but users don't own the data. Users don't, um, oftentimes don't even have control over the earnings from all that data. If you think about content creators and the way that they are explo exploited, the whole idea is that with the shift that people like Pentland at MIT are kind of theorizing about is the whole idea is to give users more control and ownership of their data and the content uh, and the ideas that they create and share on, on these platforms. So we're seeing a shift taking place. And finally, we need to remember what we said about the balancing diverse stakeholder interests. And um, this is something that Clow and Wu, they make an observation. It is common practice to design platforms in ways that capture value for the platform owner at the expense of the total value being created. And this is precisely where we argue in the paper that if you, if you do that, it's not gonna be sustainable. And we're starting to see that people are getting angry about this and participating in the Web3 movement um, and traditional platforms are losing legitimacy, right? Okay. 
Okay, that was long. Sorry for that. I talked for an hour. I hope I didn't make you fall asleep. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, yeah, it, it was very comprehensive and very well detailed. I think um, we all now know everything that we need to about, know about data network effects, but also a very interesting stories along with how uh, uh, these concepts came into practice. Uh, really interesting to know all, all the backgrounds. Um, before we open the ground for questions, uh, just to highlight uh, quickly, Robert, that uh, this uh, digital transformation group is not only composed of IS researchers, uh, but we also have academics from marketing, strategy, operations, research, and computer science as well. So um, you might uh, get questions from many different perspectives. So be prepared for that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, you can either paste it in the chat or you can raise the hand and then um, I will I will unmute you to ask the question. So I have a question here uh, from uh, Nikolai and uh, maybe before I answer, just a quick comment to start. So um, I think that the... Um, a shift has taken place and you see more and more uh, articles being published in general management. So whether it's marketing, general management strategy on these topics, right? So there is a huge openness among the management community nowadays about uh, uh, these topics around AI, uh, data, et cetera. So it's great, it's great times right now to interact and intermingle more with each other across the boundaries. Okay, so Nikolai uh, asked a question here. Um, the, the lessons learned for starting digital platforms. And I think the traditional network effects literature uh, argues that um, you need to, need to think about like subsidization strategies, right? So which sides do you, do you subsidize in order to get the chicken and egg problem resolved uh, in order to get that growth in the number of users? And similarly, you could kind of think about um, what would you need to do to, to kickstart data network effects? And, um, initially, what you need is you need data in sufficient quality and quantity, and you need to have, of course, the, the capabilities. So you need to have the right human and technological resources in place in order to scale that kind of learning very quickly. Um, I see that uh, many traditional companies like um, Semex, a, a case study that we're looking at at MIT, uh, but also BBUVA in Spain. So there are a couple of uh, large traditional income and firms that have uh, invested very heavily re in recent times in um, these data science competence center, uh, like a centralized kind of a competence center and trying to even develop such a platform capability, right? So in a way, they, they bundle these resources and competencies in, in a center and then provide these services to their entire organization or maybe even beyond their organization and beyond their industry if they're able to spin it out. And so I think uh, for starting digital platforms, you need to either get access to a strong platform AI capability through APIs and partnership, or you need to build it yourself, right? So um, I think that's the key. It's, um, that's kind of my, my answer to that. Thank you, Robert. Uh, while we are waiting for other questions, I can go ahead. Um, so I was interested about the network um, structures that you mentioned, but I was surprised to see it wasn't in the model that, that you finally developed, maybe it was included in, in design approach or how would you see uh, network structures? First, how, how would you define it for data network um, effects? And secondly, would you think if we have more centralized uh, network structure, would it be the case where uh, the perceived platform value, value is more realized by the owners uh, instead of the users? Let me go back to network structure because there was a couple of concepts here. So when we think about uh, network structure, um, certainly we, we didn't make uh, a connection in our, theor in our theorization to each one of the six elements of network structure, right? But we did make a connection to some of them. So for example, transaction feasibility. So transaction feasibility is an aspect of network structure. For example, if you think about Uber, how many um, how many drivers are in a certain geographical region in a certain moment in time, in a certain time window. And so what's the current state of demand and supply? What's the structure in that sense? And what is the feasibility that a transaction can occur based on the location um, 
and, uh, and the occurring demand and available supply in any given moment in time in a specific geographical area, right? So the transaction feasibility will be influenced by these uh, dynamics of data, data enabled learning and value creation that we discussed in this, in this presentation today. So there's a clear linkage there. Now we could go into uh, other elements of structure, but I, I, I honestly don't remember uh, the details of what I wrote in the article. Um, I don't think that I, I didn't, I didn't make any connection to ties, whether they are weak or strong ties. I didn't make any connection to that concept in, in writing the paper. Um, um, so I don't really remember the other details. I think I maybe structural holes, maybe I touched upon that. I don't know. But transaction feasibility is the one that I just remember most visibly that I made an explicit connection in the paper to that. Uh, definitely not exhaustive. We could have thought about more connections there and maybe there's more room for future research there. You know, and does that kind of ad address your question? Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, just a quick bit, the, the last part. Uh, would you think the centrality of, of the structure would mm. be would offer more value to the platform owners? as compared to the platform users? Um, remind, because, me, yeah, yeah. remind me again, remind me again of um, off the top of my head, I don't remember. Remind me again what centrality, what centrality means in Afua. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, at the end you mentioned or now. I need to, I need to, I need to remember that. Oh, because because we we simply talked about decentralized platform quite a lot, so that's why I was thinking if it was centralized, yeah. maybe it offers more value to the owners as compared to the users. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, that makes sense to me. I haven't really thought about that. I mean, centrality of members. I mean, this is a very interesting uh, concept to think about because if we see the shift towards decentralization with decentralized platforms, yeah structure of the network changes if you think about decentralized autonomous organizations or decentralized platforms more generally the question is of course whether this uh, change in the network structure in terms of centrality will uh, affect some of these dynamics uh, i think this would be a very interesting study to do like uh, how do network effects play out in in more decentralized uh, structure context i think this would be super interesting to learn about i, I haven't theorized about this. So I don't have the answer, but it's interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, yeah. Next, we have Petro and, and then Mayur. Petro, please. Um, thank you, Robert, for your very interesting talk. Um, I know you talked a lot about data. Um, I just want to g give a bit of my background. I'm, I'm, I did my PhD in computer science and database, but also I'm a software engineer by nature I've, I've developed a lot of software and architectural designs for platforms and one question i have to you is about the actual design of the platform itself i know you talk a lot about the data that the platform holds and the quality of this data in driving the interactions but what about the actual construction of the platform if it has an api if the software structure is um, good or not so have you considered this aspect in the dynamics of your theory? Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a very excellent question. So I have not considered that, but I think it would be interesting to study that in more detail in the future. If you think about um, the role that um, the multi-layered modular architecture plays um, in terms of the flexibility that it provides to developers and how that potentially impacts these, then I don't know. The role of openness, the openness of the platform, to what extent are there APIs that are exposed and to what extent are APIs consumed uh, by the platform from outside, which could have a big impact on aspects of data sharing, for example. So uh, in the Facebook example, for example, uh, it was very open, the APIs, uh, the, the, the graph API was not monitored closely. It was not governed by the platform owner appropriately and it was used to get access to social network data and then, and then that led to a data scandal um, and that negatively impact the perceived uh, privacy and security of the platform which reduced the platform legitimization which had a negative effects on the the network effects and the dynamics of the platform so um, clearly the the degree of openness of the platform 
um, is, is something that has an influence here. And we didn't theorize about that in the paper. So I think, you know, modularity and openness and maybe other aspects, uh, there, there may be um, a, a range of aspects of platform architecture and design that may uh, influence the, the nature of both the traditional and the data network effects and the interactions between them. And that would be a very interesting study to go into more detail. Actually, now with this paper, I hope that um, the scholars across the different disciplines are going to be more open-minded about receiving that, those kind of contributions where in the past, in the past, I think that network effects scholars, you know, coming from a traditional economic economist background, were not really interested in the technology. They were not interested in the technology. And I think that now um, the, the management scholars are becoming more interested. They are becoming more open-minded about understanding better what, um, what, um, scholars of technology, information systems, what they have to say and contribute to this discourse because they see that we're in a digital era and many of these platforms are digital. And so they are starting to, you know, publish special issues on digital transformation. Most special issues on digital transformation were published outside of IS. Mm -hmm. you know? So they're starting to get really interested. So we have a huge opportunity here to start going into more details there on things like the platform architecture so and design, yeah? Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, we have Mayur next. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Robert. Uh, great, uh, great presentation. And um, uh, I read the paper previously, and I, I, I it is tempting to read it again and again because it's 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 written in so so accessible uh, manner uh, that you can understand uh, and go to the depth of the concepts uh, and and clear takeaways from the paper. So so great uh, paper there. So my question was a little bit uh, tangential uh, to to the talk, uh, and uh, so in the paper uh, you don't uh, you don't discuss much about uh, the connection of data driven effects with digital transformation as a phenomenon, right? And and I understand probably because this was specific purpose uh, management audience, and and you wanted to send one message there, right? But uh, but I wanted to. Um, a pick your brain in terms of how do you see what we learn from your paper in terms of uh, if we think of traditional firms uh, embarking on the journey of digital transformation, uh, what what do we learn about those uh, journeys based on uh, what we now know uh, from your paper? Because at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that digital transformation is different in that we are seeing more and more push from the outside and it's less less and less from the inside, right? So, so I, I wanted to build some connections there, and I wanted to know your yeah, uh, views. Excellent, excellent, excellent question. And I maybe um, in answering the question, I will also circle back to Pedro's comments because I think that a key a key component of a digital transformation journey in an incumbent firm uh, is uh, evolving, adapting, transforming the legacy architecture, the enterprise architecture, and building that into a more modular, flexible, um, um, open platform. So the shift from a closed architecture to more open architecture, the shift from a less flexible to a more flexible based on modular multi-layered architecture, that kind of a shift um, is a key aspect of a digital transformation. I've, I've seen that in DBS Bank, I've seen that in Microsoft, I've seen that in BBUVA, I've seen that in many companies. And so how can you even generate and leverage network effects and data network effects if you don't create the right platform foundations, right? So, and you see that, I'm seeing that now with Semex. So Semex is a traditional, a very traditional company and they realize that they can utilize AI and machine learning to optimize some of their operations. And now they're developing this general platform AI capability out of that initiative. And they're starting to see that they could create a platform model around this. So digital transformation oftentimes also involves new business, experimenting with new business models. And in this case, experimenting with a new platform business model. Uh, so from a st strategy standpoint, and then you get into network effects, right? But the, the interesting question for understanding digital transformation as a process is really to understand the tensions that take place in that transformation between the old and the new and how those tensions are resolved. That's really the interesting question because otherwise it's not a theory of transformation, you know? Transformation, um, you need to study the change. 
and 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 so that's otherwise it's, it doesn't become a fee and i didn't study the chain because i studied platform context i studied more so this paper that i presented today is more like a paper about digital innovation it's not so much about digital transformation right right yes. right yeah okay no great great thanks um thank you my uh rotimi Pratimi, if you're speaking, you're still on mute. Oh, yes. Um, yes, um, great talk. Um, I hope, can you hear me, Teher? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I just have a question, or I just want to hear your view about this. Um, in platform research, uh, I think it's been well established that uh, the value of the platform is not about the size, but the value is based on the interaction and the quality of the interaction in the platform. And so from more interactions, you have more data. So for example, you may have a lot of users on a particular platform. If there is no quality interaction, then of course that may negatively impact the platform. More interaction leads to more data, right? But I'm of the opinion that it's a bit difficult to look at data only without looking at the interactions that led to the data being generated and also the user's interaction with the data. For example, Twitter, we look at number of likes, number of retweets, then we look at, okay, why are people liking this particular tweet? Then we begin to look at sentiment and other analysis to be able to kind of build a robust AI to be able to improve on the platform, for example, if you react to a particular tweet, you might want to look at the sentiment. You might want to kind of rearrange tweet for you next time when you come to your Twitter page so that we can be able to generate more interactions for you. So my question now is, if we cannot look at data without the interactions, then data um, network effect, how do you look at it? It's more like a bottom up or if you decide to look at it from top down, then are we not talking about more of AI network effect rather than data network effect? Because data network effect to me, more like we're coming from bottom, but for the AI part, it means we are looking at body data and the interaction, so to say. I just want to have your view on that. Yeah, no, it's interesting. So. In our paper, um, the way that we conceptualize the interactions is by drawing on this concept of uh, network conduct from Elena Fua. So the, the conduct in the network is essentially the interactions in the network and whether there is opportunistic behavior, whether that creates uh, trust or not, um, uh, et cetera. So that, that, that captures the interactions. And um, we look more at how AI influences the network structure and conduct and we look less at the other, you know, we, we look less at the origins of the data. So the, when we say data quality and quantity, we kind of assume that the data uh, is capturing aspects of the interactions and uh, on the platform and, you know, things like preferences and things like, um, you know, uh, trends in patterns and changing behaviors of users. So the data is capturing patterns of these interactions that are happening on the platform and that but we make we make certain assumptions about the data that we don't really explicate in detail in the paper so i think kotimi i think your comment is very uh, interesting because it opens up the question for future research whether we could study the origins and the nature of that data and see whether there are different conditions under certain conditions um this moderation effect of data quantity and quality will be different, right? Than under other, depending on, we just say in abstract terms, the quality of the data, right? <laughs> and the quantity of the data, but we could go much deeper there and study the underlying interactions more and, and look at more variations. Uh, I think that's a very interesting uh, idea, Rotimi, yeah. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Rotimi. Uh, Nadia? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tahir, and thank you, Robert. Um, I'm, I'm Nadia. I'm uh, one of those academics. Uh, I view myself as a hybrid academic because I have one foot in decision analytics and decision behavior. 
and my other foot into information systems. So I really appreciated your comments about Herbert Simon and Daniel Kahneman. Uh, but at the same time, I'm doing a lot of work with uh, legal services firms. And right now in the UK, legal, legal firms, you know, they're doing a lot of work. They're trying to introduce AI technology uh, because uh, they, they realize they have a lot of data in terms, you know, not only numbers, text, videos. Uh, and there are two drivers uh, when it comes to AI development. Uh, one is that they are trying to uh, augment decision-making capability within the organization. They're trying really to help their legal professionals take better decisions. Uh, so, so they try to add value that way. But at the same time, they're part of a very big network and they're trying to uh, provide value-added services to their own customers <clears throat> by extracting value from their own data. So during your presentation, I kept thinking, because I'm writing a paper, you, you know, just uh, uh, about, you know, just because I've been, I, I, I was involved in uh, an AI project and I was trying to think how can adapt your, uh, your framework to uh, a network uh, kind of setting uh, where you have, you have, you do have stakeholders, you have organizational units uh, and an observation straight away is that Data quantity is not necessarily a predictor because uh, uh, in a legal services firm, you have a lot of data, but the quality is not sufficient to, to develop AI technology uh, that, that can really uh, give you, uh, make accurate predictions. And very often you start with an AI tool and then you end up with a rule-based kind of system uh, where you try to extract uh, the algorithm from an expert or from, from an employee. So, so, so any comments you might have about that, you know, how, how your framework can be adapted to a network of actors or uh, stakeholders, that would be very helpful. Yeah, I think uh, this is very interesting. So uh, one thing that um, occurs to my mind is that we need to consider the nature of the network not just being composed of users like mm -hmm. the traditional view network effects is it's like a user network right mm -hmm. so you are a user of a fax machine you are a you like you are a human being who is using a fax machine now in in these kind of contexts that you are describing mm -hmm. we have ai actors so we have machine actors and we have human actors and we have the interactions between the human uh, and the machine actors and even machine to machine so uh, in semex for mm -hmm. example in Semix, we have multiple machine learning models that are all interconnected and feed on each other, mm -hmm. right? So there is interactions between AI actors. So there's interactions between machine models and there is AI actors like domain experts and others that are interacting with these models. Mm -hmm. And essentially, um, when you look at this network, uh, the network is a human machine network that the company is constructing and from that network, essentially, come these kind of dynamics of the data okay. network effects, where you continuously learn and improve, and you scale up. You create a, it's a new form of scaling. Mm -hmm. You think about uh, Chandler, uh, Alfred Chandler, and the theory of the corporation and the firm and the way that you scaled. And now, with these data network effects, you get to a new form of scaling. Um, so uh, it has some similarities with old uh, forms of scaling and economies but it also has some new facets and new aspects to it. And I think the key challenge for companies is how do you get that scalability? How do you scale AI? Mm. That's something that I've been researching recently in my cooperation with Bart Wixom at MIT. And we recently published a study on AI scaling that you can find on the website of MIT. It's a practitioner report. So it's not uh, obviously not theorized for academic purposes, but it is something that I'm seeing as a trend that we need to have more theories about that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, we have just time for one more questions. I think I have got one in chat, but we'll quickly go to Katrina first, and then um, we'll end up the question with the, uh, the the one from Amir in the chat. Katrina, if you can unmute Thank and go ahead, please. Thank you, Robert. Uh, it was a very nice presentation, but you mentioned from the beginning the notion of users so it's it wasn't really clear to me who's the user for example in uber or other platforms because it's not always you and ola who are waiting for a taxi the drivers are also a kind of user and usually the value is not the same for us as customers in a sense 
and for the drivers. So I can see people trying to like deceive the algorithms or create data for those algorithms. So I think that it was clarifying what do you mean by users in that sense and value for whom, because it's not always created in a sense value for all of us. Yeah, I think, uh, Katarina, this is excellent. And um, as you are speaking, uh, it reminds me of some of the very interesting theoretical work that you have been doing for some years. And the discussions that we had back in the days in Barcelona about value and what does value mean. And I think your question about who is the user is also a question about what do we think of, what is value, right? What, how do we define value? Because if we talk about a user, you know, what does a user value, you know? Like, um, and we, we are very, you know, we provide a very simplified view in our paper. We just talk about perceived value without really discussing value in, in detail. But nowadays, um, in today's society, I guess that what people perceive to be valuable changes, changes all the time. And it's much more nuanced and it's much more multifaceted today, what you consider to be valuable and not. And so I think there is important work to be done, especially to enhance the vocabulary and the understanding of the strategy scholars, because strategy scholars look at value more in terms of economic terms, you know, like uh, they look at utility. They look at, they look at value more in terms of utility. And, and I think that there is a room here uh, as we're living in a Renaissance. So if you think about it, if you go back into the old days, we had the print, you know, in the old Renaissance, we had the printing press, the printing press brought, um, you know, literature and books and reading to the vast, so to the population, right? We had the invention of the, uh, the bookkeeping system, right? Which gave, uh, you know, uh, new opportunities. Now we have the internet, the internet of information, and we have the internet of value. And we, we, see, we see kind of um, a, new, a new renaissance that is happening. And, and in this renaissance, people like Jochai Benkler uh, from Harvard, for example, he writes about a cultural revolution, new forms of non-economic uh, production are emerging. We're living in a cultural revolution as much as we are living in an in information technology and economic revolution which means that what we consider to be a user and what we consider to be value, value definitions of value uh, needs to be updated as well, right? Um, and, and this is something that the strategy scholars who have been dominating the network effects theory development and, and, and the economists, I don't think that they have considered that so far. So I think there is great room for extending theory in that area. It makes sense, but imagine like platforms, like Bitcoin platforms, that you have like big companies and you have also people who are simple users who are trying to make money and you have data that are produced almost from everywhere and people who are trying to deceive those data and those algorithms behind that so the value that is created between them is something interesting and can be completely uh, opposite for them so yes. something that is considered for you as positive value it can be damaging other people and, and that's why i use the term perceived value in the paper and there's a reason why i say there, there, there was a very uh, specific reason why we use the term perceived and um you know if i would have had more time i would have theorized about like negative network effects as well and i didn't have the space in this paper to do so but I think there is further papers to be written about these kind of important topics. So I think Katarina, you raise a very important uh, topic. And I just wanna make another note that uh, in decentralized platforms, you see that the value is so much more than just economic value. People participate in decentralized platforms because they wanna have a voice. They wanna have an influence. They wanna have control. They wanna, they wanna bring in their values into shaping the future digital world. They wanna, they wanna have a different place in the world. They, you know, there, there, there's a, there's a whole, you know, value. What is valuable is is being redefined as we speak in this cultural movement that is happening right now. Thank you. So there's another question here by Amir. You mentioned that the higher the quantity of, okay, it's about the quantity of data. Uh, so it's that one proposition about the quantity, and I wanted to know that you assume the quantity of all types of data lead us to the same result or differentiate between different types of data, structured data, unstructured. Yeah, so in this paper, we don't really make any um, distinction between 
different types of data from that kind of a let's say structural standpoint whether they are structured or unstructured or semi-structured i think what would be more interesting to be honest would be to think along the lines of what we just discussed earlier with um katarina and with others here on the call in the sense of what and, and rotini's comment uh, about you know what does this data actually represent right because the data the, so whether it's structured or unstructured is is maybe a technical aspect okay it's a technical aspect but uh, the nature of that data whether it what 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 does it actually capture and does it actually fully capture um the intentions and the values or does it or or, or does it actually not right uh, so uh, what does it actually capture? I mean, I, I think nobody has really done enough. There's not enough thinking that has been going into this. We look at data. We look at data and we just look at this as, you know, data could mean so many things, right? What is data? This is something that we don't really, really do well in our paper. We don't do that well. We don't theorize about that well. And, 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 and generally, most people don't do that well. And that's where I'm reminded of the work of people like um, um, Alaimo and Kalinikos and others who are, in a way, trying to go into that direction of theorizing a little bit more. What does this data actually mean? You know, um, and and uh, but, but yeah, we're stuck. We're such an early stage there in our research to really understand that. So good, good question. I don't have the answer. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, I think it's it's about time that uh, we are already five minutes above uh, the scheduled end. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for 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 your time and all the participants for for coming and and attending the seminar. Uh, we have for PhD students, uh, we have a PhD workshop phenomena based theorizing uh, starting at three p.m. There is a separate link. If anybody else wanted to join in, please. Uh, Feel free. Uh, you would have received an email. Otherwise, send me or pon us an email, and we we can send you the details. And um, yeah, for PhD students and and Robert, we'll see you back at three p.m. For everybody else, thank you so much for your time and and coming to the seminar. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> thank you very see much. See you in a bit. <laughs> thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. <laughs>